this seminar series is entitled, Oh God, Why? So I also want to remind you of some resources that are available. Uh, some of you asked whether uh, all the presentations here are already in a book. No, only one presentation is in a book, Patience in the Midst of Trials. I do have some other resources available in the form of books. Uh, one of the uh, recent ones is God is Faithful. God is Faithful, and He honors those who trust Him. It's a small booklet you'll find helpful. And then I also have This is Love, a book dealing with love, relationships, uh, deeper love, and higher spirituality. These available. Uh, in addition to these heart issue books, uh, there are also what I call apologetic books. These are books that deal with issues that are being debated in our churches or also in other Christian churches. I do have, uh, must we be silent? Here we stand and receiving the word. The Bible is the inspired word of God. It is the only book that reveals to us what we must do when our hopes are crushed. Let us study the Bible, for if we do so, we shall find rest for our souls. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to part four of our series titled, Oh God, Why? And in this series, we are discussing what we should do when things go wrong. I want to remind you again, the Christian life is not an easy road. The longer you stay in the Christian race and the older you get even in life, you are going to discover life is not as fair as we tend to think. There are bumps on the way. There are trials and difficulties on the way. And this series is designed to preempt the uh, tendency for us to give up so easily when we face difficulties. It is also designed to encourage individuals who may be going through some difficulties right now to have a different perspective on what they ought to do. Our subject this afternoon is, what should I do when my hopes are crushed. And specifically, we will look at even the question of death. But more than death, you are going to discover there are many issues that lead to crushed hopes. Notice the topics we have covered so far. On the opening day, our subject was, what should you do when you don't know what to do? The second day, what should you do when the unthinkable happens. The third day, what should you do when you are sorely tried? And today, what should you do when hope is crushed? Notice the intensification of the various topics. What to do when you don't know what to do? It's no big deal. Yes, you may be confused as to what to do. But then when you experience unthinkable events and tragedies, it shakes you even further. And then when you are sorely tried, when you know God could have done something about it, and yet he seems not to, that is even harder. And today you are going to discover when hope is lost, frankly, life is gone. There is an intensification of the various topics. And today's may be one of the most important of all regarding issues that lead us to ask, Lord, why? What should you do when your hope is crushed? You see, when hope is crushed, it implies a near impossibility of recovery. When hope is crushed, it implies there is an irreversibility of your fortunes. You cannot reverse it. It signals a certain tragic finality to our prospects. 
You see, when hope is crushed, there is very little we can do during those moments. Therefore, to deal with crushed hopes, we've got to plan ahead. We have to securely ground our hopes in that which is unshakable. Let me say it differently. When your hope is crushed, usually there is nothing you can do at that moment. The way to preempt that occurrence is right now start grounding your hope on that which is unshakable. You see, when hope is lost, every one of us will face that crisis. At least once in a person's lifetime, there are earth-shaking events. Events that rattle us. It can rattle a nation, individual, a business, or even a church. These hope-crushing tragedies are so disturbing that they arrest the attention of every one of us in a very compelling way. These are called wake-up calls. Wake-up calls. Wake-up calls are hope-shattering events, and they radically change the way we view our life and how we conduct our life from there onwards. One such event, one such wake-up call took place on September 11, 2001. In one single hour, the United States, and indeed, the world was changed forever. In fact, from September 11, events in this country and other countries are irreversible. It was a wake-up call event. Many lost their hope, even in their government, to protect them. But there's something else that took place on September 11. In moments just after September 11, it was discovered that people stayed away from movie theaters. They didn't want to see movies anymore. Somehow, that event changed people's priorities. Shortly thereafter, major sporting events were all canceled. For the first time, a number of sports fans recognized that there was something more important than football, baseball, or basketball. In the events following 9-11, married couples who had hitherto filed for divorce suddenly withdrew their divorces from the law courts and decided to work on reconciliation. Even people who were not known to be religious, on September 11, they suddenly decided to go to church shortly thereafter. In fact, churches were full. Some churches had to run double sessions on Sundays or Saturdays. Even people who were known to be agnostics, atheists, or non-religious, after September 11, shortly thereafter, they found religion. Nobody even had to work on young people to go to church. I was on the University of Michigan campus, and on the dais, we had whole swarms of students right there, seeking for God on that day. In our own churches, it was discovered that at least the Sabbath after September 11, churches were full. You didn't have to play drums or some rock music to attract young people to church. The music of the churches that day changed. What does it tell us? There are certain events that leave us no longer the same. We call these earth-shattering events. They are wake-up calls. You don't need clowns and puppets to attract people to church after wake-up calls. Suddenly, you start thinking differently. Old-fashioned hymns became more attractive to people after all. 
it is then that you discover what is really important. In our own church, members who never read the spirit of prophecy and also the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation suddenly began to be interested in Bible prophecies. What are we saying? Wake-up calls are earth-shattering events. They are hope-shattering events. And it is not just nations which experience wake-up calls. Businesses also experience wake-up calls. When, for example, another competitor arrives in your vicinity who is more aggressive in business, suddenly, as a businessman, you discover you have to change the way you do business. Families also receive wake-up calls, especially when they receive shocking news of adultery or a betrayal or divorce. The home is shattered, children are no longer the same, and life ceases to be business as usual. I'm talking about wake-up calls when hopes are crushed. Individuals also receive their own wake-up calls. All it may take is a devastating accident and life doesn't seem normal anymore. Or all it takes is a visit to the hospital, and then the doctor pulls you aside and said, Sam or mom, I'm sorry you have cancer. Life is no longer the same. Or if you are a young person, you go to the hospital, and the doctor tells you, I'm sorry you are HIV AIDS positive. Suddenly, life is different from there on. Politicians receive wake-up calls when suddenly they are defeated by some unknown underdog. Politics is no longer the same. Not too long ago, I think I've shared this with you uh, in some different contexts, I received my own personal wake-up call. I think I mentioned how we had a near scare of cancer when my wife was suspected of having cancer, terminal cancer. What do you do when you go to the hospital and the doctor says, I'm sorry, yeah, from all the signs, the symptoms, the diagnosis, it, it appears your wife has cancer. And the cancer is an aggressive kind, and you have, let's say, six months to live. What do you do? I don't recall what I did, even how to drive home. And when you get home and you see the children and they will be jumping and happy, not knowing their mother is about to die in six months. What do you do? Wake up call. I'm saying this today because today's message is a little different. Because I'm talking about things that radically shake us to the point of an irreversible behavior. And when that happens, believe me, that is not the time you look for a way out. Now is the time. Wake up calls. I recall in the events after the diagnosis, my wife's life changed. Her eating habits changed. Suddenly she became more health conscious. Not only that, I noticed her attitude to clothing also changed. She likes shopping, looking for sales. I did discover that on occasion, she started pulling down clothes from her closet, folding them, and then labeling them. This goes to my niece, this goes to my aunt, this goes to this person. Suddenly, clothes lose their appeal after wake-up calls. Even the way she related to other people changed find her making a phone call to somebody, literally saying something to the effect, listen, if we have disagreed with each other or have been fighting over this issue, let's forget it, let's put it behind us. Reconciliations that were hard to come by previously suddenly become possible. Not only was she changing, I also was changing. My relationship with her changed for the better. I became more patient. Hitherto, I tended to be a little more uh, impatient, 
when I considered some of her actions as, you know, unreasonable, something she felt were reasonable, I thought they were unreasonable, impatient. But now, in the wake of a possible terminal cancer, I discovered I had patience. I wouldn't say or do things that would in a way hasten her speedy death. Even the way I looked at my children changed. For once, I started noticing footprints of my wife on every aspect of my children. The way they smiled, the way they peeled, you know, fruit, let's say, uh, oranges. Even little things, suddenly I noticed so many things I never saw before. What am I saying? I'm talking about earth-shattering events, tragedies that change your life radically forever. What should you do when your hopes are crushed? That is the subject we are attempting to answer today. Wake up calls change the way people look at themselves and others and the way they look at life in general. Fortunately, in my case, it was not cancer. After further tests, it was discovered the cancer was gone. Of course, the doctor may say it was a false diagnosis. It could be a miracle. Regardless, it gave me a different picture about life. And if you have ever grappled with cancer or some other serious condition, you would understand that life is never the same again. The way you look at yourself, the way you look at others and life in general are never the same again. You don't have to wait until the earth-shattering or hope-shattering events take place. When it does take place, it may be too late. Now is therefore the time to re-evaluate the nature and foundation of our hopes. And now is the time to secure them solidly in something that is unshakable. That is why today our message is entitled, What Should You Do When Your Hope Is Crushed? A more fitting title for today's message would have been, Where Is Your Hope? Where is your hope? And we are going to investigate God's word to discover where a Christian's hope should lie. And when it lies there, no matter what happens to you, however earth-shaking it may be, you can still stand. Before we go any further, let's bow our heads for prayer. Our Father in heaven, we are thankful for this far you have led us in life. The things you are teaching us this afternoon, we invite you to speak to us and help us to redirect, reorder the source, the foundation of our hope, so that when those tragic moments come, we shall not be deluded. Thank you for hearing us, for we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. For our scripture reading, we are going to look at the book of Job. Job chapter 17 and verses 13 to 16. Job chapter 17, verses 13 to 16. In the dark days of Job's trials and afflictions, he asked one of the most penetrating questions anyone could ever face. And that question is, where is my hope? Let me read the context to you. Job chapter 17, from verses 7, 13 to 16. Job 17, 13 to 16. It reads, if I wait, the grave is my house. What Job is saying is, the longer I live, I am ultimately going to die. And when I die, I am going to be put in a grave. 
I have met my bed in darkness. What he's saying is, when I die and I'm put inside the grave, that six foot, you know, hole, it's like very dark. That is where I'm ultimately going to find my resting place. Verse 14. I have said to corruption, thou art my father, and to the worm, thou art my mother and my sister. He's saying, when I am placed in the grave and my body starts decaying, ultimately worms would eat me up or my body would disintegrate. You know, these worms will start eating you as if they were your closely knit relatives. After he analyzed our ultimate condition, in verse 15, he asked the question, and where is now my hope? Here is his question. If at the close of the day we are all going to die and disintegrate, or if for any reason you are murdered and thrown away somewhere, worms eat you up, if that is the end of human beings, where then is my hope? As for my hope, who shall see it? They shall go down to the bars of the pit when our rest together is in the dust. If you take verses 13 and 15, and then put them together, this is what his question sounds like. If I wait, the grave is my house, and where is now my hope? That is the question we need to answer. See, there is a saying many of you have heard, which says, while there is life, there is hope. You've heard that before. But biblically speaking, this is not entirely accurate. We tend to say, while there is life, there is hope. But in the Bible, the deeper truth is, while there is hope, there is life. For without hope, there is no life. When we have nothing to hope for, we inevitably grow depressed. And not only depressed, but desperate. The reason we get desperate is because hope is lost or we fear we are losing hope. I'm not going to get married. My chances are dying out. So we get desperate trying to get married. The reason we want to find a job so desperate is because we fear our hope. Our chances of gaining employment is fading. We get desperate. When hope is lost, we get depressed and we get desperate. And this desperation and depression often results in bitterness. It results in rage, in fury and hatred for life. Loss, the loss of hope also diminishes our sense of self-worth. And in some cases, where there is a feeling that all hope is gone, such a feeling leads people to commit suicide. The reason many commit suicide is there is a feeling that there is no hope. So why should I live? The point then is when hope is lost, there is no life. You see, hope is a tender plant. It is easily crushed and it is easily extinguished. And so the question I'm going to ask you this afternoon is, where is your hope? If you place your hope in human dependencies, where would be your hope when those human beings fail you? Let's say if your hope are in your children or your friends or your children, and these individuals fail you, where would be your hope? If your hope is in your job, in your business, and that business fails you, or your job falls up and you lose your employment, where would be your hope? If today your hope in a meaningful relationship or meaningful future is encased in education, and suddenly you fail that examination so that your education is literally aborted, if your hope for the future is in a home or a relationship and that relationship is shattered, where would be your hope? Job is asking us, where is your hope? When you are seized with a guilty conscience, when your self-worth dissolves into self-doubt, 
when your confidence is shaken and when you are diagnosed with a terminal disease, whether it be AIDS or cancer, where would be your hope when death strikes home? Notice when Job asked the question, where then is my hope? The question is not, what is your hope? That was not the question Job asked. Job was not asking, what is the object of your hope? His question was, where is your hope? In other words, what is the foundation? What is the grounds of your hope? Where is your hope? Is a question about the source, about the foundation of your hope. Do you have a solid foundation of your hope? You need to remember, hope is not a wishful thinking or a mere optimism. You know, sometimes the way we think about hope, you might almost get the impression that we are confusing hope with wishful thinking or optimism, and the reason is not far-fetched. It is because in many cases, that is how dictionaries define hope. I was comparing a series of dictionaries to find their definition of hope. This is what I got. Here are some definitions of hope. Hope is both a verb and also a noun. For example, as a verb, the dictionaries will tell you to hope is to expect or desire. Pay close attention to this. Is that hope? The fact that I'm expecting something or I'm desiring something doesn't necessarily make it hope. The dictionary will also tell you hope is to wish for something with expectation of its fulfillment. For example, I hope to be married one day. Is that hope? Or I hope to have two children. Is that hope? Listen, what is the guarantee that you would even have two children? If there is no secure foundation, then the so-called hope is nothing more than wishful thinking. Another definition of hope is to put confidence or trust in somebody. Well, the question is, what leads you to put your confidence and trust in a person? Or to look forward with confidence or expectation. That's the verb. If you look at the noun, the dictionaries will define hope as a desire of something good, which is accompanied with expectation of obtaining it or a belief that it is obtainable. Okay, I'm going to medical school. I want to be a doctor one day, and very soon I'll get my MD degree. That is hope. Really? An expectation of something which is thought to be desirable, does that make it hopeful? A pleasing expectancy. The dictionaries do not accurately give us a definition of hope. And no wonder many of us are not fully grounded and we cannot effectively answer Job's question, where is your hope? Let me say it differently. For many people, hope is nothing more than a wish or an expectation of favorable outcome. At the very best, hope is a strong expression of optimism in a future situation. And I ask, but is that really hope? When Job asked the question, where is your hope? The question is more than a wish list or something you are optimistic about. There is a great difference, you need to know, between a general feeling that what is wanted will happen, which is how the dictionaries define hope. There's a difference between that and the grounds, the positive assurance that it will actually happen. For example, let's say I am a single man and I'm saying that one day I will marry the most beautiful and the richest woman on earth. It is a wish. If there is no guarantee that this would happen, I am becoming, or I am acting crazy or delusional, or as I put in your notes somewhere, optimism about some prospects without 
any guarantee that we would ever arrive at that object of our hope is delusional. It's crazy. One day I will build a mansion. What is the guarantee that you would actually build a mansion? One day I will go to medical school. If you are flunking your biology with C's and D's, what makes you think you will get to medical school? You are delusional. You are crazy. In other words, a mere wish, a mere optimism without some solid foundation is not hope. It is delusion. Marxist philosophers, communists, refer to it as a pie in the sky when you die. Psychologists or counselors call it escapism. You are not facing reality. Wake up. You have no hope. Job's question is designed to wake us up. Because his question is, what is the ground of your hope? What is the foundation of your hope? Unless you secure your hope in a solid foundation, when the crisis hit, you cannot stand. Our topic this afternoon, what should you do? when your hope is crushed. And the basic thesis is this. When your hope is crushed, it is almost too late. Therefore, the way to prepare uh, is to do so ahead of time by grounding your hope in something that is unshakable. That is what Job is asking. Where is your hope? That question is a call to root our hope in a solid foundation. The tree of hope is, when the tree of hope is firmly rooted and nourished, the desired fruits will be forthcoming. On the other hand, when the foundation of our hope is on shifting sand, in times of crisis, we cannot truly live or even survive. And so this afternoon, we are going to look at where a Christian must place their hope and that which makes their hope more secure than a mere desire or wish or expectation. I tell the story of one young woman. Her name was Theresa. Theresa lived in Chicago. Not too long ago, or a couple of years ago, I received a call on a Wednesday. The call came from Teresa's father. Teresa had become a Christian, a Seventh-day Adventist, partly because of uh, our ministry. Very splendid, godly woman, married with two little children. And the call from the father said, Samuel, you have to come right away because your friend Teresa is seriously ill. Teresa had been diagnosed with breast cancer, it was terminal, and the doctors had given her up to die. And so she was brought home. She was brought to the parents' house uh, because they had more time to take care of her. But in the course of her being there, Theresa had become very hostile to the family members. She wouldn't talk to her mother or father. She was upset with them. She was upset with her uh, husband. She would not even talk with her church pastor. Very angry, seemingly bitter. And when the parents knew not how to deal with the situation, they felt that because Teresa and I were good friends, perhaps I may be able to help Teresa talk. And so they called me that Wednesday, and I drove down from Michigan, uh, I was in Berrien Springs, went down to Chicago, went to the parents' house. And even though Teresa was still alive, the house seemed as though Teresa was already dead. The place was quiet, surreal, no one wanted to talk. And so after greeting them, they basically pointed uh, uh, me to the room where Teresa was. I gently knocked on the door and uh, I mentioned that, hey, this is Samuel, your friend, here. And then Teresa said, sure, you may uh, come in. And um, she was at that time lying in a bed. I don't know whether you can see it on the screen, lying in a bed. And uh, when she saw me, she uh, literally pulled herself up. 
and sat up. And before I could even say good afternoon or good morning, it was late morning, she shot straight at me. She said, tell me, am I going to die? I, I was caught unprepared for this question. And so I was fumbling for an answer. I said, Theresa, you haven't even said good morning to me or welcome. He said, listen, I want a straightforward answer. Am I going to live or am I going to die? And from the tone of her voice, she was very serious. I said, Theresa, listen, are you tricking me or what? I was trying to get her to talk. But she looked very serious, and then she said, listen, Pastor, I respect you. And if you can't tell me a straightforward answer, please walk out. I mean, Kia is a girl we've been very free, and now she was quite uh, serious with me, and she was looking at me, expecting me to answer. And so I had to give her an answer. I said, well, Theresa, are you really serious? Do you want an honest answer? She said, I have given you my word. If you can't answer, please walk out. Am I going to live or am I going to die? So at that point, I said, I don't know how I got the answer, but I think the Holy Spirit whispered that to me. I said, Teresa, from the look of things, from the Teresa I knew in the past and the Teresa who is looking at me, it appears you are going to die unless the Lord intervenes. I added that one. And suddenly, she burst into laughter. And that confused me even more. Because I said, what are you laughing about? The fact that you are going to die? He said, oh, no. I knew you were going to tell me the truth. And so I was expecting the truth. I said, the truth about what? He said, I know I'm dying, and I knew you would tell me I'm dying. I said, okay, since you know you are dying, do you think an angry person will make it to heaven when Jesus comes? If indeed you are dying and you think you know you are dying, why is it that you are upset with your parents and your husband and your pastors? And then she confided. She said, listen, I know I am dying, but my pastor, my parents, my husband come to me and tell me they have been praying for me, they have fasted for me, and they know God is going to heal me. And I said, so? He said, how did they know God is going to heal me? Do they have direct access to God? I know I am dying. And for them to claim that God is going to heal me is quite frankly their own story they are making up. They are lying to me. And because I know I'm dying, I don't want liars to be by my bedside. That's why I have banned all of them from my bedside. So I said, okay, since you have banned liars, what about angry people? Because you have anger in your heart. How are you going to face God with anger? And so we started to talk. I asked her, what plans have you made for uh, your death? You have two little children. When you die, who will take care of them? By the way, if you are really serious, you are going to die, and you know you are going to die. How would you like your funeral to be? How would you like to be dressed in your casket? Who should conduct your funeral service? What songs should we sing? What scripture reading should we do? How do we plan your funeral? We started talking. Actually, I wish I could transport you into that room to watch how a Christian prepares to die. We started talking about so many things. I called her attention to the fact that, Theresa, today you are dying. The worms of cancer, the virus and the bacteria and all these germs of cancer are killing you. But one of these days, you are going to fall asleep. Because when you study the Bible, there are many ways to die. I called her attention to Genesis chapter 4, where Abel died. His death was not from cancer, he was violently murdered. I called her attention to Luke chapter 13, how some people were murdered by Pilate, some people died from accident, a tower fell, killing them. I said, Teresa, your death is not this violent. Some people died like Lazarus, they were sick. And I said, that is closest to yours. 
you are sick and you are about to die. Some died after torture. Stephen, Acts chapter 7. Some people died from old age. I call the attention to people like David, Moses, Jacob, and the rest. And then Hebrews 11 gives us accounts of many people who died the death of martyrs. They were sown ascender. They were burned alive. They were drowned. I said, Theresa, there are many different ways by which people die. But what is common in all is when they die, they are sleeping. And so today, cancer is eating you up. You are dying. But if your hope in the Lord holds on, you are going to fall asleep. And the next voice you are going to hear is the voice of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so I asked her the question, where would you be when you die? And so we started reviewing some of the texts in the Bible that talks about where the dead people go. See, as Seventh-day Adventists, we know what the Bible teaches, so you may take it for granted. But when you face the prospect of death, you are going to discover the biblical teaching is a very hopeful teaching. In Job chapter 14, verses 14 and 15, Job says, When I die, if a man dies, will he live again? And he answers, Yes, all the days of my appointed time, I will wait till my change comes. For at that time, God, you would call, and I would answer. What Job is saying is, when we fall asleep, when we die, a time is coming when Christ is going to call, and we shall rise. Not only that, the biblical teaching of the resurrection is rooted in our Lord Jesus Christ, his statement that, I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Revelation 1 verse 18. And Jesus added, I have the keys of Hades and of death. In John chapter 6 and verse 40, our Lord Jesus Christ said this, And this is the will of him that sent me. This is God's will. That everyone who sees the Son and believes on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. I reminded Teresa, Teresa, do you believe this passage? Jesus says the will of God is that Christ came into the world, that whosoever believes in him will be raised up at the last day. I read to her, John chapter 5. And verse 28, do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and will come forth, those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. As Teresa was there and we were planning her funeral, by the way, we discussed how her funeral should be conducted and everything, we started reviewing her foundation of her hope. I called her attention to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. Why should we have hope even in the face of death? Verse 16 continues, 1 Thessalonians 4. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, and with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus shall we always be with the Lord. I reminded Teresa, one of these days, after you fall asleep, Christ would come and raise you from the dead. We read together, 1 Corinthians 15, 51. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, we shall not all die, but we shall be changed, verse 52, for in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, referring to the second coming of Christ, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. 
And then verse 54, so when this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. I told Teresa, yes, cancer may be killing you right now, but when you die, Psalm 116 verse 15 says, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints, which means Angels will mark your tomb, your resting place. It is precious in God's sight. I reminded her of Revelation 14, 13. Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, said the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. With these words and many other Bible passages, we reviewed the life of Teresa. We made sure she has given her life to the Lord Jesus Christ and that if she should die, she would die in the hope of the resurrection. We made provision. I encouraged her and she later did it. She reconciled with her family members, made things right. I left that Wednesday back to Michigan with the promise that I'll see her the next week. On Friday, I got a call from the father again who said, you have to come right now because, Teresa, your friend is really dying and we've rushed her back to the hospital. So that Friday afternoon, I drove back to Chicago, went to the hospital. The family members were gathered. And then I stood by her bedside. Uh, she wasn't speaking at that moment. The parents said she may be in coma. We weren't entirely sure. I took the hand of Teresa and literally squeezed her, and I said, Teresa, this is your friend Samuel. If you can hear me, I want you to squeeze uh, my hand to indicate you can hear me. I am not sure she did, but somehow in my mind, I thought she did. We started talking. I said, Teresa, you recall two days ago, we were talking about this event about the possibility, if it is God's will for you to fall asleep. I turned to the family members and I shared with them that our last conversation and the preparations we have done and that regardless of what the Lord would allow uh, to happen in Teresa's case, she would still die in the Lord. If she lives, she will live for the Lord. After I reviewed all of this and read to them the same Bible passages, we sang some beautiful hymns right there that Friday evening, and then a short while thereafter, Theresa died. After her death, the family members called me by the side and said, uh, Theresa has two little children. One was, I think, about two, two and a half. The other was about five. They wanted me to take those two children to the funeral home to view the body. Uh, you, you all know the situation here. When someone dies, it's sent to the funeral home, and then before the viewing, special time is given to family members to, to, to view the body, to grieve, so that by the time others come, the shock is not as great. And so the family members requested, please, we cannot, as grandparents, take the children to view their mother. It's too hard for us. Can you? They know you as your mother's best friend. Could you take the children? And I said, yes, I would. And so I took these children, and we went to the funeral home, just three of us. And um, the casket was placed right there. The, the room was a little somber, a little dark, and they displayed flowers like this all around. And um, I stood there quietly looking at Teresa. You know, if you've never seen death at close range, you wouldn't understand what I'm talking about. There in the casket lay the body of a young woman who a few days earlier was full of life, was full of emotion. Yes, there were laughter, there were anger, but she had life. But now her lips were sealed. Even her skin color had changed. Something strange had happened to that person lying there. I stood there quietly. Meanwhile, the children 
The older one, the three-year-old, was standing by me uh, looking at the mother. The two-and-a-half-year-old had no clue what was going on. He was just going around picking the flowers and enjoying it, just having no idea that this thing that has just happened, but for the resurrection of Christ, was irreversible. I stood there quietly, looked into the face of Teresa, and that moment, in a few seconds, it appears Satan was whispering doubts in my mind. Doubts that seemed to say, what if you lied to Teresa when she was alive? What if there is no resurrection? What if those Bible texts you read to her were all myths? What if they are not true? What if the Bible cannot be trusted? It means you lied to Teresa and you let her die believing a lie. The very thing that led her to ban family members, you actually let her to believe a lie. What if Teresa would never rise again? And I stood there, literally shaking. I don't know how long it was, but those questions kept pulsating in my mind. And for a moment, even my faith, in God started shaking. I was almost disbelieving. During that critical time, when I was wondering, will Theresa rise again? The only thing that saved me at that very moment when my hope was being crushed was a passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Because in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the Apostle Paul answered the question, the question about the grounds, the foundation of our hope. Notice what the Apostle Paul says. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, reading from verse 16. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. Let me pause. What Paul is saying is there is hope. For a resurrection. And that hope in a future resurrection is grounded in the fact that Jesus Christ died and rose again. That's what Paul is saying. If the dead do not rise, if Teresa will not rise again, then it means Christ never rose again. But Paul's point is Christ indeed rose from the dead. Therefore, all those who have died in the Lord will rise again. Say amen. amen. Resurrection is rooted in the fact that Jesus rose. Then in verse 17, the Apostle Paul continues, If Christ is not risen, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. That's Paul's point. Every one of us profess faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul is saying our faith is in vain if Christ never rose from the dead. But the good news is our faith is not in vain because Jesus actually rose from the dead. Paul continues, if Christ never rose from the dead, you are still in your sins. Can you imagine how we can live with guilty consciences when we know that all the sins we ever committed and we thought we had confessed to God haven't been forgiven. The lies we have told, the abortions we have committed, the lies, the stealing, all the bad and mean things we have ever committed and now we've given our lives to God believing our sins have been washed away. Paul says, without a resurrection of Christ Jesus, we are still in our sins. But the good news is, no, our sins have been forgiven and they have been forgiven because Jesus died on Calvary but he rose again on Sunday morning and that is the ground of our hope that we can live without a guilty conscience. He continues in verse 18. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. His argument, if there is no resurrection from the dead, if Christ never rose from the dead, then 
every Christian who ever died is perished. In other words, they are dead as a skunk that has been hit by a car. No difference. But Paul's point, no, they are not perished. Because Jesus rose from the dead, and that is the ground, that is the foundation of their future resurrection. He adds in verse 19, if we have only hoped in Christ in this life, we are of all men most pitiable. If Jesus never rose from the dead, then listen, Christians, you are the most pitiable, miserable looking people because you are believing a lie. But Paul's point is, no, we haven't believed a lie because there is hope of the resurrection. Death is not the end, and the secure foundation of that hope is in what happened to the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Say amen. Verse 32, he adds, if the dead are not raised, then let's eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. What is Paul's point? The fact that there is hope of a resurrection is the foundation for the way we live now. Eating, drinking, dressing, doing whatever you want, you can do whatever you want if there is no judgment day, no day of reckoning. But there is a day of reckoning, and that is why Christians cannot live anyhow or do things anyhow. Yes, in that critical moment, when I was wondering, did I lie to Theresa? Was she lied to? What rescued me was 1 Corinthians 15. There is hope beyond the grave. Christ's resurrection gives us hope beyond the grave. He himself said, I am he who lives and was dead. Behold, I'm alive forevermore. I hold the keys of Hades and death. And by the way, this is what baptism represents. The moment you give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ and you stand in the baptismal pool and the minister raises his hand like we saw this past Sabbath over here, you are basically saying, I believe that Jesus died for my sins. He was buried and rose again. And today, by faith, I also accept him as my Lord and Savior. I am dying to sin. I am going to be buried, and I will rise again with a new life. Baptism also reminds you that should you die today, however means your death will come through sickness, through death, through old age, whatever means, by which you arrive at your death. If you should die today and be buried, when Christ comes, you will rise again, which is what Romans chapter 6 from verses 3 to 5 tells us, that many of us, all of us who were baptized, were baptized into Christ's death, that we shall rise and walk in the newness of life. From the moment of your baptism, the Bible tells us in Romans 6, 11, likewise also, reckon yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Buried with him, Colossians will tell you, in baptism, wherein you are risen with him through faith of the operation of God who has raised him from the dead. The fact that today you are a baptized Christian is an indication that you have put on the Lord Jesus Christ and everything about him. From the moment of your baptism, you change. Your outlook, the way you live, the way you dress changes. You will begin to walk the walk and talk the walk as a Christian. You start bearing the fruit of the Spirit. You develop new tastes for spiritual things. You form new associations and you desire to please God in all things. You start spending time with Him in prayer. You study His Word. The Sabbath becomes a day of joy and delight. You join a family, God's family. Because the Bible says when you are baptized, you form a new family, the church of God. Now, this is the ground of our hope. It is rooted in Christ. Now, with this as background, let me summarize for us the foundation and the nature of the Christian hope. Remember, the question this afternoon is, what should you do when your hope is crushed? And I mentioned when hope is crushed, life is almost irreversible. And so now is the time 
to ground your hope in an unshakable foundation so that when that event happens, you are not going to be found wanting. So I'll give you 12 points about the nature of the Christian hope. Number one, by the way, in your notes, I have mentioned that the Bible says unbelievers have no hope. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 12, and 1 Thessalonians 4, 13. And the Bible teaches that the Christian's hope is a living hope. What is the nature of this hope? Number one, God is the source of the Christian hope. Say amen to that. I have a number of Bible passages there. Romans 15, 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace and trust in him so that you may be able to overflow with hope. Joel chapter 3, verse 16. The Lord will be the hope of his people. Psalm 71, verse 5. For thou art my hope. Number one, the Christian hope is rooted in God himself. Some of us say, I have no hope, no peace in my family, in my work. Who said you find peace or hope at work? It is not there. Your hope, your peace is rooted in God. Number two, though the Christian hope has its origin in God, Christ is the messenger. You cannot find this hope unless you find Christ. First Timothy chapter 1 verse 1 says, Jesus Christ is our hope. Colossians 1 27, Christ in you is the hope of glory. So God is the source of our hope, but in order to find this hope, you need Jesus Christ who is the messenger of hope. Number three, the nature of the Christian hope. The Christian hope brings joy. You find this in Romans 5 verse 2. We rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Romans 12 verse 12, be joyful in hope. See, the reason why many of us have no joy is because we have no hope. And we have no hope because our hope is not secure. Number four, the Christian hope brings patience. You find this in Romans chapter 8. Verses 24 to 25. For in this hope we are saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what he already has? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. Let me explain. Many of us are impatient because we have no hope. The reason we are fretful about life, about your job prospects, your family situation, is because we have no hope. Because true Christian hope brings patience. Number five, Christian hope is also linked with faith. You cannot say you have faith if you have no hope. And if you have true hope, you have faith. Notice the definition of faith. Hebrews 11 verse 1 defines faith in terms of hope. It says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Or the NIV puts it this way, now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we don't see. So the nature of the Christian hope is such that it is linked with faith. Number six, the Christian hope also believes in the promises of God. You find this in Romans chapter 4, 1 to 3, and 16 to 22. It is the kind of hope that Abraham had. Because he believed that God was shaping his future, we are told, against all hope, Abraham in hope believed, being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he has promised. Listen, if you cannot take God as his word, if you cannot believe God's promises, then you have no hope. Because one of these days, the only thing that will hold you when hope is lost is God's promises. And Christian hope believes in God's promises. It is this kind of hope 
that makes you hold on even though all appearances look, you know, like there's no way out. Number seven, the nature of Christian hope. Conversion is the way we come to Christian hope. How do we obtain this hope, which, is, which has its origin in God? The Bible says it comes only by conversion or new birth. First Peter chapter 1, verses 3 to 9. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us a new birth into what? A living hope. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. The point is, the way to obtain hope is by conversion. And so, the question is, are you converted? Number eight, scriptures are the means to obtain and sustain the Christian hope. After you are converted, the way you continue holding on to your faith is through the Bible. You find this in Romans 15 verse 4. For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning that we, through patience and comfort of the Scriptures, might have what? Hope. You have no hope if you don't study the Bible. Many of us will read all kinds of books, will read all kinds of magazines, watch all kinds of television, and yet spend no time with the Word of God. The Word of God is the only source by which we can nurture and sustain our hope. If you are not making the habit of studying the word, a time is coming when your hope is going to be crushed and there will be nothing you can hold on to. Number nine, the Christian hope is established in the resurrection of Christ from the dead. We've already mentioned this. In 1 Corinthians 15, 19, 20, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruit. Jesus' resurrection gives us the grounds for our hope. Number 10, the Christian hope is securely grounded in a living Savior who ministers in the heavenly sanctuary. Because Jesus is the one who is a living Savior, as long as Jesus lives and he is ministering in heaven, we have hope. Look at how Hebrews 6 verse 19 says, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, which entereth into that within the veil. It is talking about the sanctuary. That's why of all people who should have hope, Seventh-day Adventists, should be a people of hope. Because we believe that Jesus Christ died, he rose again, and he is ministering in the heavenly sanctuary. And because he is there, we have hope. You can appeal to him in any situation. Number 11, the second coming of Christ is the consummation of our hope. I'm giving you a Bible study on hope. Titus 1, 12, uh, 13 says, the second coming of Christ is our blessed hope. Today, everything may falter, but one of these days, Jesus will come, and he's going to make all things new. That is the consummation of our hope. And then, number 12, the Christian hope governs our life today. 1 John 3, 3, and every man that has this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure. If you have this hope we are talking about, your life is different. If you read in 2 Peter, seeing that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness, looking unto and hastening the coming day of God, wherein the heavens will be on fire, will be dissolved, and then you read on, wherefore, beloved, Seeing that you look for such things, be diligent and be found of him in peace, without spot and blameless. The nature of the Christian hope changes the way you live your life today. And so the question is, where is your hope? Do you have this hope? 
if you don't ground it now, one of these days, it can be illness, it can be loss of a job, loss of a spouse, loss of your health, whatever it is, your hope will be crushed and you would lose your way. Now is the time to secure your foundation. Remember Job, he asked the question, where now is my hope? Three chapters later, he answered it two chapters later in Job 19. He said, for I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And behold, though after my schemes worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh I'll see God, whom I'll see for myself, and my eyes shall not another, though my reins be consumed within me. Job secured his hope in a risen Savior who will come again. Job was an Adventist. That was the grounds of his hope. That is why he could say, though he slays me, yet will I still trust in him. Without this hope, ladies and gentlemen, life would be meaningless, it would be miserable, and some of us will commit suicide, the loss of hope. Now is the time to secure our foundation in him. Job 11 verse 18 says, And thou shalt be secure, because there is hope. There is hope. And once you have this hope, you would be secure. Ladies and gentlemen, life is not as easy as you think. Sometimes we think people who live in the third world are people who are having it hard. No, I've been in this country for some time, and I know life is not easy even here. One of these days, it is even going to get worse. Our hope is going to be crushed. Where would be your hope when that happens? Now is the time to ground your hope in an unshakable source, our Lord Jesus Christ himself. And when that day comes, you wouldn't be found wanting. May the Lord help us to root our faith and our hope in him. Is that your wish? Is that your prayer? Why not bow for prayer? Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the Christian hope which is securely rooted in the work of our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that even though today our hope may be shattered, we can still hold on Believing in you, we thank you that you have given us this opportunity here at Camp Meeting to study so that in the days ahead, none of us will be found wanting. If there's anyone here whose faith and hope has been shattered, we ask that you would lift their eyes to see you in the heavenly sanctuary, that by faith they can hold on. We know not what the future holds for any one of us. Help us to keep trusting you no matter what. Prepare us, Lord, for the second coming. For we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. This media was provided by Hope Media Ministry. For this and other great witnessing material, please visit our website at www.hopevideo.com. Our email address is hope at hopevideo.com. You can also listen to much of our media at our online media center for free at www.hopevideo.com. That's hopevideo.com.